Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the February 26th, 2018 edition of the weekly Top 3, our weekly 15-minute-ish podcast covering the top three things on our mind as we make the turn from the past week to the one ahead. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can follow and participate in the discussion with us of news and commentary and on these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. You also can find this and past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and on my website at bgkeithley.com. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the administration's newest plan for paying off oil tax credits. Second, is taking half of the PFD just step one of the Senate's fiscal plan? And three, funding the university. First, let's start by talking about the administration's newest plan for paying off oil tax credits. For those that would benefit from a refresher, recall that from roughly 2007 to last year, the state had a program in which it agreed essentially to subsidize exploration and drilling costs by certain small producers in their efforts to develop new fields. The producers would expend money and the state would then write checks to those producers uh, to offset a, po a portion of the expenditures. The problem with the program as we saw it was that it wasn't producing a bang for the buck. The expenditures that we were making, uh, $4 billion to $5 billion dollars, uh, that the state was making to, to subsidize the producer activities wasn't, wasn't resulting in additional oil and gas development and production that would produce a return on that, even recover the cost of, much less a producer return on the $4 billion. The, we would have been better off as a state in terms of money, uh, state money, to take that $4 billion, invest it alongside the permanent fund in the stock market and other places, and earn a return that way. Because of those and other concerns, the legislature largely moved to terminate the program last year. There's still some pieces of it that are transitioning uh, to termination, but they're relatively small. But even though the state terminated the, the legislature and governor signing the bill terminated the program last year, there are expenditures that were made in the past that still qualify under the program and, and, on, and, and for which the state still has uh, an obligation to, to make the payments. Those accumulated expenditures that, are, that the state, uh, that, that are still viable under the program, total about a billion dollars. The question is, is how to pay those off. The statute under which the program has been governed since 2007 sets forth a methodology for paying off those uh, credits. Uh, it uses a portion of the production tax revenue collected by the state each year um, and puts that in a fund that then is used to pay off, uh, pay off the credits. In years where the production taxes are high, either as a result of high oil prices or high production or a combination of both, the, the, the amount going to the um, uh, oil uh, to the fund is relatively high, and so the credits get paid off quickly. In years like we've had the last few years where oil prices are low or production is lower, uh, the amounts going to the fund are relatively low, and as a consequence, the amounts available each year to pay off the accumulated uh, obligation is relatively low, and it stretches out uh, the payment over the of the obligation over several years. Because we've been in that low price, low payoff environment the last few years, and the and the and the legislature and administration have adhered to the statute uh, by paying out relatively low amounts, uh, the producers have become uh, impatient. I think is a word. Uh, with that, with that low rate of payment, and have and have asked for and lobbied for uh, higher payments to them uh, under the program, essentially advance paying them uh, for obligations that otherwise would be paid out uh, over in the under the statute uh, over several years. We've opposed accelerating those payments because, frankly, uh, we, we for a number of reasons we've. Been in a low, the state's been in a low revenue environment. 
Uh, we have uh, been in deficit spending. We borrowed from the uh, Constitutional Budget Reserve. Uh, and now in last year, well, the last two years, we've been cutting PFDs. We think it doesn't make any sense to be cutting the PFD, not observing, defaulting on the state's statutory obligations under the PFD to its own citizens, and at the same time accelerating payments, giving more money than the statute requires uh, to uh, to the producers. The state has now, this, this year, the state's come up with a new proposal. And the new proposal is essentially to go out and borrow a bunch of money, a billion dollars uh, over time, uh, and use that money to pay the producers uh, up front uh, to accelerate those payments. Frankly, we're not a fan of this proposal either. And to be honest, uh, some of the reasons the administration have has given for it are laughable. At a hearing last week uh, before uh, the Senate Resources Committee, uh, Sheldon Fisher, the Commissioner of Revenue, uh, and, and, and the person who's developed this program came to the committee and said one of the reasons, in fact, the first reason he listed uh, that the administration wanted to go forward with this program is, is, it would be cut, is because it would act as a, quote, economic stimulus to the oil and gas producers to give them a bunch of money uh, right now to pay off these credits uh, right now. And so the state was justified in going out and borrowing money from the future uh, in order to have that money now and give it away or give it to producers in, in accelerated payments as an economic stimulus to their further activity. The reason that's laughable uh, is two things. You're just, you're just borrowing from the future. You're just taking from uh, revenue the state would have in the future uh, and sucking it into the present and paying it out now, uh, borrowing to pay it out now, costing future generations the obligation to pay that money back when it's the current generation's obligation to pay it. Um, and, and so that's, you know, economic stimulus by borrowing is always something that, that we're very skeptical of. But the second reason it's laughable is because at the same time, the administration's proposing that to generate an economic stimulus in the economy by borrowing a bunch of money and giving it out. The administration's proposing also to cut the PFD, the very thing that has the, quote, largest adverse effect, largest adverse impact, close quote, on the overall economy of all of the various new revenue options uh, and has uh, the uh, is by far the costliest to Alaska families of all of the rev of all of the new revenue options. If the administration is really concerned about economic stimulus, it ought to meet its statutory obligations to the citizens of the state of Alaska and, and pay the full PFD as, as, as required by or as, or as obligated under the statute. The, the administration is proposing essentially to ignore one statute that limits payments to producers at the same time as they're ignoring a statute to Alaska citizens uh, that, that, that obligates them to be making full PFD payments to the state. So if you want an economic stimulus, Governor Walker, if you want an economic stimulus, Commissioner Fisher, pay the PFD, comply with the statutory obligation under the under the PFD, avoid the very thing that has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and is by far uh, the costliest to Alaska families. We think it's ludicrous to be cutting those payments to Alaska families, uh, cutting uh, what ICER has said has the largest uh, multiplier effect uh, of all of the so-called new revenue options, cutting that uh, and then arguing that, oh no, but oh no, in the meantime, we need to go out and borrow money to create an economic stimulus for Alaska's oil producers. Stimulate the Alaska economy through its citizens first. Don't go out and borrow money uh, uh, to give more money uh, in advance of, uh, of the obligations to Alaska producers. The second issue we want to discuss this week is whether taking half of the PFD is just step one uh, of the Senate's overall fiscal fiscal plan. Uh, two weeks ago, in a column in the Midnight Sun, uh, a column written by former Fairbanks news miner, political uh, reporter Matt Buxton, and now uh, a blogger with the Midnight Sun, uh, Buxton had a piece that uh, talked about uh, uh, some comments Representative Paul Seaton had made on the House. Uh, essentially, in, in Buxton's terms, accusing some unnamed members of the Senate 
majority of planning to continue to cut the dividend down to zero before being forced to implement some sort of income tax. Uh, Seton didn't name names, and in that column sort of went in the in the in the file cabinet um, to to keep a check on in our file cabinet to keep a check on uh, on future statements. Last week, last Friday, in Buxton's uh, in the Midnight Suns Friday in the Sun column, sort of his catch-all for the week, uh, uh, Buxton reported on comments that Representative Chris Birch had made uh, during the House Minority Republican uh, press availability. Now, what Birch says is interesting because he's running uh, to succeed Senator Kevin Meyer, uh, who Meyer's running for lieutenant governor, and Birch is running uh, for a place in the Senate, uh, uh, unopposed, in the at least in the Republican primary uh, to this point. And Birch is fairly close to, to uh, members of the... Uh, of the Senate majority. And here's what Birch said. There is very little interest in, in seeing an income tax to sustain or perpetuate a dividend. In other words, com if you, if you look at comparing a dividend as, as financing government, cutting the dividend as financing government or using an income tax to finance government, Birch is saying there's very little interest in perpetuating the dividend um, uh, over uh, over an income tax. Frankly, we think that's confirmation of what Seton had said uh, the week before, that there really is, that the Senate really is prepared to entirely obliterate the PFD, cut the PFD to zero before they would uh, implement an income tax. That the, the current Senate plan, SB 26, is simply step one uh, of the Senate's plan to cut the PFD to zero uh, if that's necessary. The reason that's important is there's been no indication that the legislature or the administration is going to get spending under control. Um, they talk a good game about about cut making cuts. Last year they talked, the Senate talked a good game about making, uh, making cuts, but most of the cuts they made last year were just accounting tricks designed to conceal uh, the spending that they were continuing to make uh, by pushing payment for a bunch of that spending off to categories other than unrestricted general funds, which is where you normally look uh, to see uh, to see how much uh, the state is spending uh, on government. And this year, uh, they've not repeated the same sort of mantra. The Senate's not repeated the same sort of mantra about uh, making big spending cuts in order to get spending down as they ultimately did last year, in fact, um, after you take into account the accounting tricks, um, the Senate is, seems to be on on a track of spending uh, roughly uh, what the governor has proposed uh, in his budget. So if you can't get spending under control, and, that, and that's roughly a half a billion, maybe more, uh, above long-term sustainable spending levels uh, if you don't use some sort of new revenue. So if you can't get... Uh, spending under control, and the Senate seems to be, the government generally, and the Senate seems to be going along with not being able to uh, get that uh, under control, uh, then what are you going to do? You're going to need new revenues in order to fill that spending gap. And what the Senate appears to be indicating is that they're going to take the PFD down to zero, convert uh, revenues that otherwise are intended for the PFD uh, over to funding government to avoid uh, going to an income tax. Why are they doing that? Well, as we've talked about on these segments before, they are defending their donor class. The Republicans are defending their donor class, the upper 20%, uh, largely who don't suffer much with PFD cuts, minute percent of their income, but who are concerned about the impact on them uh, of income taxes. So in order to avoid, in order to protect that donor class, in order to protect against income class uh, income taxes hitting that donor class, uh, the Senate is essentially pushing the responsibility for funding government over on the middle and lower income classes uh, by cutting the PFD. The problem with that is that they're hurting the overall Alaska economy and Alaska families at the very same time. Cutting the PFD has the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy of all of the new revenue options, jobs, and income. It is by far uh, the largest, uh, the co most costliest 
uh, alternative to Alaska families. So what the Senate is doing and what Chris, Chris Birch uh, and, and others in the Senate are doing is they're throwing over the Alaska economy. They're, 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 they're doing things that hurt the overall Alaska economy in order to protect their donor class. We think that's bad. That's something we'll continue to talk about on this program uh, in the weeks ahead. Final thing we want to talk about this week is funding the university. Over the course of last week, there were a couple of articles. One was about President Johnson's uh, State of the University address talking about the drastic cut in his terms, the drastic cuts the university had made uh, over the past few years as spending reductions have, have been taking place, uh, and talking about his concern about the impact of, of those cuts on the university's overall mission. And then uh, subsequently in the week, uh, news that the House Finance Subcommittee dealing with the university chaired by Adam Wool of Fairbanks uh, had, had increased uh, funding to the university by some $19 million uh, over, uh, over the uh, uh, governor's request uh, to increase resources to the university. That's understandable. Fairbank or Wool is from Fairbanks uh, in the uh, full committee. Uh, the, the vote, that vote to, to increase funding was confirmed. Uh, Representative Steve Thompson from Fairbanks crossing over from the Republican side uh, to the Democrat side to vote, uh, vote in favor um, of maintaining that funding. Here's the, the problem with that. The university system uh, continues to be funded, e even, even at the reduced levels that President Johnson has expressed concern about, the university system continues to be funded at substantially higher levels in Alaska than in comparable states. The university publishes a list of peer institutions. Uh, we looked at that a couple of years ago. The peer institutions they had listed at the time were the University of Montana system, the Southern Illinois University System and the University of Maine System. When you looked at state funding to those peer group institutions, they were at least half and some more than half uh, below uh, uh, the University of Alaska funding. The largest of the three spent about $10,000 per student uh, in, in terms of state funding. The University of Alaska System spent something like $20,000. Uh, in state funding uh, per student. The problem with the university, system, the, the university system in Alaska is we're trying to do too much. The Constitution talks about, establishes the university. It doesn't talk about university system. It doesn't talk about three universities. It talks about establishing the university. Over the years, as we've tried, as we've established these additional universities, the University of Alaska Anchorage, the University of Alaska Southeast, we have stretched our university system too thin, so that we 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 build it up at a time when we had the fiscal resources uh, we told ourselves to be able to support that sort of university system, but we didn't. And now that we're in much more realistic fiscal times, we need to face up to the fact that we've built a university system that is too big and start shrinking it back to one that's sustainable on a long-term basis. The fact that we are double our peer group, double the next highest in our peer group in terms of state spending should tell us we've built uh, too big a university system. Going in the opposite direction, trying to restore funds, $19 million in funds to the university at a time when we're cutting the PFD, when we're cutting other programs, is just the wrong direction to go. The University of Alaska, frankly, needs to be cut further. It needs to be brought down to something in the range of its own self-described uh, peer group in terms of, uh, of state spending. And until we do that, uh, they're going to continue to be uh, a problem and, a, and, a, and an issue uh, in coming to grips with overall spending level. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you for joining us this week. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and keep track of us during the week on our Facebook and Twitter uh, uh, pages. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three. 